What in the world is Sola Scriptura? I mean, I thought I knew what it meant. I made a video about it um, um, a while back on my channel talking about how because Jesus needed to explain the meaning of the scriptures to the apostles, that Sola Scriptura doesn't really work. But some people said to me, no, Keith, we believe in Sola Scriptura. And I understand that. But other people said, you just don't get it. You don't know what it means. You're ignorant, Keith. You don't know what Sola Scriptura even is. Because if you did, then you wouldn't say such things. Now, maybe they didn't say it with that kind of tone. Maybe they were really loving and nice. I don't know. That's just how I read it. So what I thought we'd do today, my friends, is let's take a look at what we can learn about Sola Scriptura, which is obviously a big topic. But I'm just going to, to keep things kind of short and to get right to the point, I'm going to consult one of the leading leaders of Bible teaching of all time, right? Mr. John MacArthur from Grace Community Church, who wrote this article um, in August of 2021 called, What Does Sola Scriptura Mean? So what I thought I'd do today is interact with this article a little bit and then share with you why I still don't believe it. All right, spoiler alert. What Does Sola Scriptura Mean? by Mr. John MacArthur. Here's what he says. The Reformation principle of Sola Scriptura has to do with the sufficiency of Scripture as our supreme authority in all spiritual matters. Sola Scriptura simply means that all truth necessary for our salvation and spiritual life is taught either explicitly or implicitly in Scripture. It is not a claim that all truth of every kind is found in Scripture. The most ardent defender of Sola Scriptura will concede, for example, that Scripture has little or nothing to say about DNA structures, microbiology, the rules of Chinese grammar, I love that, or rocket science. This or that scientific truth, for example, may or may not be actually true, whether or not it can be supported by Scripture. But Scripture is a more sure word, standing above all truth in its authority and certainty. It is more sure, according to the Apostle Peter, than the data we gather firsthand through our senses. And then he quotes 2 Peter 1.9. Let's look at that. That's what's, And that verse says, And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Okay. And then it, there's a little thing out here where it says, Scripture is the perfect and only standard of spiritual truth. Furthermore, we are forbidden to add or take away from the Scripture. And then he, quote, he references Deuteronomy, Revelation. I'm not going to go through all those right now. To add to it is to lay on people a burden that God himself does not intend for them to bear. And then he throws Matthew 23, 4 in there. I think it's cool when, when MacArthur and others like throw Bible verses in there. But when you like look at the Bible verses, I'm not sure that they mean what they're trying to say that they mean. Scripture is therefore the perfect and only standard of spiritual truth, revealing infallibly all that we must believe in order to be saved and all that we must do in order to glorify God. That, no more, no less, is what sola scriptura Means. And then there's a quote from the Westminster Confession of Faith. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men. Boom. Okay, my friends, we got all that, right? So now, I mean, I think I get it. I think I understand what Sola Scriptura means. But where ultimately did it come from? Did it start with John MacArthur? No, he himself says it's the Reformation principle, which, of course, who are the Reformers? The first one, of course, Martin Luther. Now, Martin Luther has a very famous quote from the Diet of Worms where he says, "...unless I am convinced by the testimony of the Scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in the councils alone." Since it is well known that they often err and contradict themselves, I am bound to the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not retract anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. Amen. Pretty powerful statement that Martin Luther makes there. But we have to recognize that's not the end of the story. If you look into it, you're going to see that even within the Reformation, Martin Luther and other reformers were getting kind of frustrated with what other people were doing with his idea. No, I said his idea of Sola Scriptura, because although you can find foreshadowings of it in, in different people in a little bit earlier times in history, um, you don't really find it very well defined. And I would say... Martin Luther is the guy who people would look at and kind of define it. But even Martin Luther, 
doesn't necessarily define it for everybody. And there's an article written by a guy named Matthew Bar Barrett from the Gospel Coalition who talks about this, and I'll link that in the description below. He says, therefore, the reformers became frustrated when certain radicals sought to disregard tradition altogether. These radicals did not defend and practice sola scriptura, but instead turned to nuda scriptura, o solo scriptura, scripture alone. Now, you might go, wait a minute, Keith, are we talking about two different things here? Well, we kind of are, and that's sort of the point. See, here's the thing. When we go into these realms of talking about how God has revealed himself and the role of the Bible, once you take away the authoritative interpreter of the Catholic Church from this equation, now what are you left with? You're left with man-made traditions. And when you're left with man-made traditions, it's just a matter of time before some other man comes along and says, well, I like this part of what you said, but not that part of what you said. And it gets modified and changed and people start to nuance it and mess with it. And who gets to ultimately say this, but not that? It's hard to put a finger on it when you can't authoritatively define what it even is. And that's what you see happening with Sola Scriptura, because why is one guy's view of it any better than someone else's? And I just find it ironic that Catholics are always getting barked at for their man-made traditions when Sola Scriptura, my friends, it is a man-made tradition. And I think a lot of people are starting to understand that. There are some Protestants today who are becoming uncomfortable with Sola Scriptura because they don't want to believe the Bible. They say, oh, well, that's an interpretation of the Bible, or that's just one way that people looked at things in history, but we've got a different view. So it's not so much the words of the Bible that are authoritative, but the meaning of the Bible. And now I think we're getting somewhere. The question is, who gets to define what that true meaning is? Right now, for example, Methodists and Anglicans, they they sometimes are described as prima scriptura because they say we need other things, too, like tradition and experience and reason. But they would say that the scripture is the primary authority, which I think that sounds good, but I kind of find it problematic because let's face it. Oftentimes, those particular denominations have been the ones that have strayed farthest from what the scriptures have said. So how can you say something is primary when you mean by what it says to do the opposite? See, now I'm not here to conflate all of these differing positions into one thing and call it sola scriptura because I'm, I'm acknowledging that they're not the same. But what I want to do is talk about the problems with this, even after reading this incredible explanation from Mr. John MacArthur. And I know you might say, well, these are the typical Catholic answers, but they're still true. The first one is this. The principle of Sola Scriptura is itself not found in the Bible. And I know that might seem kind of like a, a, a caricature of an argument or a, a stock Catholic argument, but I think that it's important because if you're going to say that the Bible alone, I mean, MacArthur himself says that the Bible implicitly or explicitly contains everything that we need for salvation and spiritual life. This is the statement he's making. Show me where it says what he's talking about in the Bible. Because the fact is, it doesn't. Now, people will say things like, and they'll quote all these verses. Oh, well, you know, the word of God is, is active and it's sharpened like a two-edged sword and it cuts to the heart and, and it's breathed by God. All of those things. Well, friends, we believe all those things as Catholics about the Bible. We believe everything the Bible says about the Bible, but what it doesn't say, we don't add to it. I find it very ironic that when, when people want to add things like, well, that means these particular texts, that that's okay to add that to the Bible, but we're somehow the ones that are adding all this man-made stuff to the Bible. Speaking of adding and taking things away, all right, let's look at, for example, what MacArthur uh, drops as his scriptural proof for taking away or adding things from the scripture. He, he puts Revelation 22, 18 and 19, and he says this, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of this book, of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. Okay. Which book is the book of Revelation? This, now, what's interesting is that John MacArthur is equating this text about the book of Revelation and the prophecies described in it as to the entire canonized Bible that was given to the world in the fourth century. To, to take this text from Revelation and place that upon all, if you really wanted to be literal about it, you would basically say 
that the book of Revelation is the only text that you can talk about in this way. Because if you add, did you add the other books of the Bible to it or did you add it to the other books of the Bible, right? Think about that for a second. And consequently, what did Martin Luther want to do? He wanted to take the whole thing out. So do you see what I'm getting at? There's all these problems. Now, let's look at this other one, Deuteronomy 4, verse 2. This is another one that MacArthur quotes. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord that I command you. All right, MacArthur, let me ask you this question. Do you eat pork? Let me ask you this question. Do you have garments woven from from one type of fabric and another type of fabric? Because if you do, then you have taken or added to to this word. Because what Deuteronomy is talking about is the law of Moses. You're assuming, you're presuming, you're adding all the rest of the Bible to these words of, of the book of Moses, which may or may not be the right thing to do. I'm just saying, be honest about what you're doing. It certainly isn't talking about a book of canonized Old Testament, New Testament that, that you guys all accepted you know, over a thousand years later. So I think it's interesting when you start looking at a lot of these texts that people throw at us about Sola Scriptura, what you realize is they they don't prove it. They don't prove Sola Scriptura. They just sound good. Okay. So here's the second thing. So first of all, it's not taught in the scripture. Second thing is this. It presumes we know what scripture is authoritatively through a non-scriptural revelation. Now that's problematic. When you're going to say the Bible alone, the Bible alone, the Bible is all sufficient. As MacArthur says here, it's going gonna, it's gonna to tell us explicitly or implicitly everything we need to know. Well, it doesn't tell us what books belong in it. It doesn't tell us what's canonized or not canonized. It doesn't tell us, for example, whether or not what is referred to as the Apocrypha belongs in the Bible or doesn't. The Bible doesn't say that. You've got church fathers that teach that the those books belong in the Bible. You've got the earliest canonized collection of books from the fourth century that have those books in them. But then later you have other people that don't. So who gets to say, right? Where Where is that authoritative voice in the Bible itself? It's not there, my friends. You, you need an authoritative, non-scriptural um, voice to tell you what is authoritative, which, duh, think about what that means, Right? What, what else does that non-scriptural revelation teach? What else does that tradition tell us? And how do we know it's accurate? If we can't trust what the church teaches about what books belong in the Bible, then, then why do we trust what it teaches about anything? And if we do trust what it teaches us about what books belong in the Bible, then why don't we trust what it teaches about everything else? Think about that. Number three, Sola Scriptura does not help us understand what the Bible means. Now, I know people freak out, but it's the truth, you know, whether we want to admit it or not. People disagree. I mean, Martin Luther, for example, at, 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 at Marburg, Germany, when they got together to talk about the meaning of the sacraments and the Eucharist based on Scripture alone, these guys didn't agree. They excommunicated each other. They, they couldn't come to a definitive belief on what Jesus meant when he said, this is my body, this is my blood. Consequently, Martin Luther argued more for the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist than some of the other reformers, but they disagreed, and yet they had the same Bible. And of course, that's just a microcosm. We've seen it grow and grow and grow. Disagreements about baptism, disagreements about whether you can keep or whether you can lose your salvation, disagreements about hell, disagreements about all sorts of things, church authority and and how the church should be governed, friends. They're all over the place. Everyone with the same Bible all saying you just need the Bible, right? Or the Bible alone is the only source of infallible authority. Well, if it really was able to function that way, then we wouldn't have these problems. See, this was the issue I was addressing in my video. Jesus needed to explain to the disciples what the scriptures meant about him. Now, a sufficient work is only sufficient if it's able to be understood completely independently. And the fact that the Bible isn't means that there needs to be an authoritative interpreter who can say this is what it actually means. People don't like that, though, because then they have to accept everything that authority says because we don't want to pick and choose. You see, if this weren't true, then everyone would be able to read the Bible and come to the same conclusions. Now, people want to argue and say, well, no, the Bible means this, the Bible means that. But what I think we really mean at the heart of it is that the proper interpretation of the Bible is what is infallible, which means you need an infallible interpreter. 
Otherwise, how can you know that the interpretation is correct? Now, what's interesting is this is exactly what Catholicism teaches. You see, the Catholic Church doesn't believe that the Bible isn't inerrant or infallible. But what the Catholic Church teaches is that the Scripture and the teaching magisterium of the Church, the tradition of the Church, together come from the same source, the Word of God. Friends, it's both and, not either or. Listen to what the Catechism says. The apostolic preaching, which is expressed in a special way in the inspired books, was to be preserved in a continuous line of succession until the end of time. Just like the Ethiopian eunuch said to Philip in in the book of Acts, he said, how am I going to understand what I'm reading unless someone explains it to me? Friends, why is that in the Bible? Because it's a true principle as well, that we need the church. We need Philip, right? One of the apostles to explain to us what is meant by all these things, because let's face it, whether we think we're super smart or not, when we take away the tradition of the church, when we take away the, the historic understandings of things and the, the apostolic tradition passed down from the disciples, and we just approach this book as though it dropped out of the sky in a vacuum, we are going to be in serious trouble. We'll never agree, my friends. We'll never know what it truly means because that's not how it was ever meant to be used. Because number four is this. Sola Scriptura actually is contradicted by the scripture. And I just gave you that verse from Acts chapter 8, I believe, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Also, friends, of course, from St. Paul, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold to the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or epistle. There are some things that have been taught by word and some things that have been taught by, by word of mouth, friends. And I know that not everybody who believes in Sola Scriptura believes, like even MacArthur says, we don't believe that everything Jesus ever said or did is contained in the Bible, but just the stuff that we need. Well, then why doesn't Philip say to that Ethiopian eunuch, you don't need me to say anything to you. Just read it. Everything you need is found in there. You know, remember, everything that was written down had to have happened before it was written down. So there was a period of history where the things that were taught in the scriptures orally, that's all they were. They were just orally until they were written down. It wasn't like the apostles instantly went into a room, wrote everything down, and nobody knew anything, and then it was like they came out and said, here's what happened. It's not how it worked, my friends. The Bible is the word of God, no doubt, the infallible, inerrant word of God, but it's not the only infallible, inerrant word of God. The traditions of the church, my friends, the teachings of the Catholic Church passed down by Jesus to the apostles. Friends, we need both. So if you want to disagree with me, that's your prerogative. You can be, be a sola scriptura Christian. But you know what? Here's the deal. I, I do understand what it means, but I just don't agree with it. Thanks for watching, you guys.